if you guys would pray with me. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to be here again, to look into your word, to open up our hearts, to hear from you, that our ears would be attuned to your spirit today. Lord, we are not as we should be, practically, and yet we're everything that we need to be, relationally, that you have broken through, Lord, that you have given us a relationship with you by your own shed blood. And Lord, as far as you're concerned, we're already seated in the heavenlies. So to pray that you'd help us to rise to that as we wait upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, men. It's good to see you all here back today. Pray all is well with you guys this morning. How many of you woke up with aches and pains today? Wow, a young guy woke up with aches and pains today. Wow. Praise the Lord, we woke up. Because it's coming a day when we won't. It's coming a day when we won't. And I absolutely believe that. One twenty. Yeah. Moses was one hundred and twenty. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural force abated. <laughs> I like. It. Okay, you, you better hold on to that one. <laughs> well, here we go. We talked yesterday about leadership, and I tried to explain how we're all leaders. God has called us all to be leaders. We are all examples of who he is. We are all light and salt and cities on a hill. And God has commanded us that we do that and that we be that. It's not anything new. It's pretty plain in the scriptures, right? We're going to talk about the essential foundational element of faith of what it is to believe God's word. And how many of you can do better with that? Yeah, we can all do better with that. I can do better with that. So there are things where I say, well, you know, the Bible says it, but I don't know, I don't see it in my life. Because when we see it in our lives, then we believe it, right? Like when you've been through some things and God brings you through some difficulties and hardships, you say, Okay, God does do that after all. It's not just something that's nice written in his word. It's something I've experienced. It's the difference between just knowing a thing with your head and then knowing something in your heart. You know, when God brings you through hard times, it builds your faith. It it takes you to another level in your relationship with him and your usability for other people. And so that's essential for leadership. I don't know how you lead without it because otherwise your faith is in yourself. And like I said, if you ever find a girl who's really interested in you, you know there's something wrong with her. Because she doesn't really know who you are. She doesn't know your heart. She doesn't know your thoughts. She doesn't know all of that. And for her to be interested in you, it's like you have no idea what you're getting into. I said that yesterday. I still mean it. Faith. Faith is one of those things that's going to pull us through when it's difficult. Faith is something that Abraham showed when he took Isaac. When God said, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, to a mountain where I will show you. And there I want you to sacrifice him to me. It seems like an incredible request. Although in that time... Everybody seemed to be doing it. The Amorites, everybody was doing that, sacrificing their children. And here God said, I want you to do that. This son that I promised to you that you had in your old age, I want you to sacrifice him to me. And we understand it was a picture. He was prophetically painting a picture for us of who Jesus ultimately, that God the Father would come and sacrifice his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We also understand the picture of what it is 
to take that which is the most important thing to you and have to give it back because it's his anyway, right? And, you know, some of us hold on to things pretty tightly. We've grown very fond and affectionate of things in our lives and people in our lives. And yet the Lord is going to require all of it back at some point in time, right? So enough rambling. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And wow, all my updated notes are not there. And I don't care. Amen. So faith is substance. It's evidence. When people look at you, do they see the substance of things hoped for? Do they see the evidence of things not seen? You look outside and you can see the trees all moving around and we understand that's wind. That's evidence of things that are not seen. It is the substance of what we understand and what we define as wind. That's what faith is. It's something that's seen. It's not felt. It's not imagined. It's seen in what you do. It's seen in your attitude. It's seen in your words. It's seen in your behaviors. It's seen in your practices. It's seen in your checkbook. Faith is seen in everything that you do. It's evidence. It's substance. Amen? Amen. So we need to define that much like love. We need to define that too because people think it's just how you feel, but then that changes. We know that love doesn't. And so we have to define those things. So that's what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. And then in Hebrews 11, he goes through this entire list of this great cloud of witnesses that we're surrounded by who are proof that God is who God is. And he does what he does. And it's great for us to read. I don't know. It encourages me to read through that entire chapter, all of the things that God did. And then the writer of Hebrews so incredibly overwhelmed says, so what am I going to say? I don't have enough time to talk about Barak. I don't have the, you know, people who were, who were slain and they were glad that they were slain because they have a better resurrection. And I can't, I, I mean, I don't even have time to tell you about everything that God did. Just absolutely overwhelmed with this example of faith. And we need to have our noses in the book, men, if we want to have faith. If you say, well, you know, sometimes Pastor Dave, I doubt, and sometimes I'm weak. And, you know, you have a benefit that the disciples don't have. The disciples that traveled with Jesus did not have the New Testament. They had Jesus right there in their face for three years. Boy, boy, I would like that. But you know what you have? You have a record of it. And you have so much more. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. He's not just upon you to do a particular task. He's in you as a comforter, as a counselor, as one to come alongside the paraclete. So we have it way easier than those people did. But faith is substance. Faith is evidence. And it should be seen. It should be heard. It should be all of those things, not just imagined and felt. I think that was my only point on my notes. Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You know what that's like, right? Imagine you had a son and your son comes up and he goes, dad, you're probably going to say no, but could I get 20 bucks so that I could go and take my girlfriend to McDonald's? I'm going to say no before he asks because he thinks so low of me that I'm going to say no. You're probably going to say no. Okay, I'll just say it now. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
You must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hey God, you're probably going to say no. But could you do this thing for me? I'm just saying, you know, if you feel like it. If you're not too busy. What an assault on his character. That's what it means. When we come before God, we need to have faith that he hears us, that he's there, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I think usually our lack of faith comes because we don't diligently seek him. But you know he's our Heavenly Father anyway. You know he loves us anyway. You know it pleases him to fork over 20 bucks. <laughs> My son asks me and he comes humbly and he says, Dad, this is what I want to do. And he's all excited about it. He goes, but I don't have the money. I'm going to say yes before he even asks the question. Do you think God's any different? God seeks to increase your faith. He seeks to reveal himself all the time in relationship with us. Why would we not ask him? You remember when you got saved, when you asked the Lord into your life? I do. I asked him to open my eyes and help me to know who he is. And I wasn't going to believe the guy next to me witnessing to me. And I wasn't going to believe the book he was quoting from. I needed to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ and it happened and I'm a different person. So I'm not nearly as wretched as I used to be, believe it or not. But when I come before God, I need to remember a, he's listening. He cares. He's my father. He loves me that he is. And he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Take time, take time to ask him because he, he loves to do stuff. I don't know about you, but he, as a father, I love to do stuff with my kid. My son says, hey, uh, it's Monday night. You guys coming over? Absolutely, I'm coming over. Well, if you're busy, if I'm busy, I'll make myself unbusy. Right? Because when you want to be something, you, you want to be somewhere with somebody, you just push stuff aside, right? When it's a priority. You know, God is looking for people like that who want to invest in a relationship and he's looking to pour himself out. But we need to do something. We have to believe that he is and he's a diligent, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In Matthew 14, I'm going to read a scripture for you. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. By the way, this is after the feeding of the 5,000. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves and the wind was contrary for the fourth watch of the night. Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so he said, come. And then Peter had come down out of the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. And when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink as he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when he got into the boat, the wind ceased. And then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. Now it's a nice little story. And we read through it on, on just kind of a cursory level and read it as a story. You'll notice three immediately's. Did you notice them? There's three immediately's put in there. I want you to notice that there's a couple of things. Fear is mentioned a couple times too, isn't it? 
I'm going to say something to you. Fear is the enemy of faith. Either you have fear or you have faith. You can't have both. One will gobble up the other. So Jesus takes them and puts them in the boat. Any of you remember why he put them in the boat? He had just fed the 5,000. The people rose up and said, well, this is pretty cool. This must be the Messiah. We need to take him into Jerusalem right now and stick him on the throne to David because he's the promised Messiah. And you go, wow, these people actually believed in Jesus because he did a miracle for them. Well, they, they, they just thought they had a gumball machine that they didn't need to put quarters in. They were there for a meal. And they started murmuring about forcibly making Jesus king in Jerusalem and kicking those doggone Romans out. And Jesus said, boys, <laughs> get in the boat, go away, go, 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 go. Because you can't handle this temptation, especially Peter. Peter would be like, oh, heck yeah, I got a sword, let's go. Guys, I'll meet you on the other side, okay? Just get away from this crowd. You know, it's a good idea to get away from a crowd that has ill intent, right? Or else you might end up going to jail with them. I, I learned this early. And so he pushes them out into the boat. And it's interesting. It, it, it takes a certain amount of faith to not join in with the crowd and go away. And it's hard work rowing. I don't know if any of you have rowed, but it, it's, it's some real action on your arms and back. And Jesus said, get in the boat and go. And you know what they did? They went. It takes faith to jump in the boat. It takes faith to part from the crowd. It takes faith to be obedient to Jesus, to do what he calls you to do. And he might be asking you to set out across the lake. And we know that the weather wasn't so great. And the funny thing is, Jesus sent them into that. Do you think he didn't know about it? <laughs> Jesus sent, him, sent them into that weather. With the wind at your face, and they're trying to put up a sail, and they can't put up a sail, so it's got to be rowing. And they're rowing against the wind. And Jesus goes up onto a mountain to pray by himself. Faith makes you to go places that you're not comfortable or even safe because it's he who sends us. There are places where Jesus will send you that are not safe and they're not comfortable. And it's going to be completely different than what everyone else is doing. You ready for that? That's called leadership. And on the fourth watch of the night, by the way, during the night, there are four watches because it's basically dark at 6 p.m. First watch is until 9. Second watch is until 12. Third watch is until 3. The fourth, the fourth watch is between 3 and 6 in the morning. Now, how long have they been rowing? All night long. You know, we think we have a bad night when we can't sleep. These guys couldn't sleep because they were rowing the whole time. Presumably, it was still daylight. Sends them out. And now it's somewhere between 3 and 6 in the morning. And Jesus sees them because, remember, he went up on a hill to pray. And he sees them in the middle. So all night rowing, they're only halfway across. That's pretty depressing, isn't it? Lord, I thought you called me here. What the heck? I'm sure you guys never say that. But I do. Lord, you brought me to Grace Bible Fellowship and then all this happened. What are you trying to do to me? Kill me? Oh, he's got more efficient ways to do that. It was the fourth watch of the night and Jesus went to them. Walking on the sea. Well, that's amazing. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, it's funny, I had to mention it twice. They were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. It's amazing how fear tends to fill in the blanks of things. We're out in the middle. We've been, we haven't gotten any sleep. We're sleep deprived, and we've been rowing all night. And Jesus shows up. And all they can see is his, 
you know, outline probably. And they're like, it's a ghost. And it's coming for us in the boat. Where's faith? Zero. On the faith meter, zero. They're afraid for themselves. And certainly they're expended. Certainly they're at the end of themselves. But isn't that when we get tested? When you're too hungry, you're too tired, you're overworked, you're too hot, too sweaty, whatever. There's some kind of pressure on you. So our job is to make sure we have no pressures on us at all because we'll fall to pieces unless you have faith. And then you can go without sleep, you can go without food. You can go without air conditioning. I spent 10 days in August <laughs> in Haiti. You can have 10 days of no air conditioning in the middle of one of the hottest places I could think of. But it takes something out of you if you try running on your own steam. Amen? So this is, this is something to take note of. Fear. Fear, like faith, is fed by the invisible unknown. Your fears are more about what you believe than if there is an honest threat. I want you to think about that. Your, fills are like a, your, your fears are like a mad lib where you fill in the blanks with the unknown. So is faith. Faith, you have to fill in the blanks with the unknown, don't you? What do you think Joseph did when he went through everything he went through? He had to fill in the blanks, the unknown blanks with his own, his own understanding of what he thought was going on. And that reveals more about you than it does the situation. Take a piece of grass, a long one, and tickle your friend's neck or better off your wife or girlfriend or your sister. And get around the back like this, like it couldn't possibly be you because it's way over there. And tickle them on the neck. And you're going to see people do crazy things. You know why? Not because it's a piece of grass. It's because they imagine it to be something else. You see how fear fills in the blank. Now, if all of a sudden you look and, you know, if my wife looks and she sees I'm playing around with her and I got a piece of grass on her neck, she's going to go cut it out. And she'll go like this. But before that, what's she going to do? Ah! You know, you're going to do all of that kind of aerobics, right? Why? Because the imagination fills in the blank with whatever it is. And that your reaction shows more about what's in you than what is exciting you. Your fears reveal more about who you are. And the places that you have faith reveal more about who you are than anything that's going on outside of you. It's a ghost. What did that reveal about them? They were weak in faith. Jesus comments on it and gives us that. So don't take my word for it. And they cried out for fear. Notice they had no faith. They had fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. These guys were scared to death. Be happy. Be happy, boys. That's like the total opposite of what's going on, right? Jesus is so sarcastic. Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. By the way, notice he said, please don't be afraid. He didn't say, try not to be afraid. He said, do not be afraid. We can go through the Psalms and the Psalms say the same thing. I will not be afraid. Well, that sounds awfully willful. That sounds like the flesh. Or it's faith, and you're being obedient to what the Lord's told you to do very clearly many times. So who do you belong to, men? Jesus. You belong to Jesus, in case you were wondering what the answer was. They should have told you that in Sunday school. Jesus is always the answer. Be of good cheer, as I do not be afraid. And Peter answered him. Who? Peter. Peter. What's his name? Peter, you know, Peter's a lot like you. He's a lot like me. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. <laughs> C 
couple of you that are laughing understand. What? I'm going to ask you a quick question. Whose idea was it for Peter to walk on the water? It was Peter's idea. It wasn't Jesus' command until after Peter said, if it's you, because see, I need a little bit more proof. If it's you, you tell me to walk on the water and I'll walk on the water. That was Peter's response to the Lord saying, don't be afraid, be of good cheer. Lord, if that's really you, command me to walk out on the water and I'll walk out on the water. Whose idea was it to walk on the water? Peter's idea. Bizarre. Jesus just said, calm down, Peter. I'm on my way. I'm almost there. You're just a little, you're just a little over the top, bro. Right? But he didn't say that. What did he say? Come. That should change the way you pray. You know, some of us are so fearful when we pray that we're going to step on God's toes or we're going to somehow be praying against his will. Or Peter said, Lord, if it's you, call me out in the water. I'm going to walk to you. And the Lord said, come. That's just crazy enough. It might work. Matthew might be writing it down right now for our benefit. That should change your prayer life, man. Fear like faith is fed by the invisible unknown. How you fill in the blanks is up to you. Faith was inspired in only Peter. Peter had a limited faith. Lord, if it's you, notice he didn't say, Lord, it's you. Let's take a walk together. He said, if it's you, I need you to show me. How many of you guys pray that God shows you signs and wonders? Lord, I need it written in the sky. If, if you really want me to keep this job, I'm going to walk in tomorrow and the boss is going to give me a, a raise. Have you ever heard somebody say something and later on it actually happens? And it was just crazy? When we were back in Keyport and we were looking for a place to be, we were pay paying $4,900 a month rent for that bank building. And the church began to grow. It grew to the point where we had to go to two services. And we were trying to buy the building across the street. We were in discussions. And we were getting it at a great deal. And it would have opened up the possibility for all kinds of ministry. We would have had more than enough room. It, 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 I just thought it was the best. It just seemed like that's what the Lord wants until I went into the town and said, we're interested in purchasing the building across the street. And somebody laid into me with volume and words I won't repeat, telling me that they'll never have a church in Keyport. I was devastated. It's like, Lord, you call me here to Grace Bible Fellowship and things are growing and seemingly doing well. And here's this bright, shining opportunity. And we just got shut down hard. I had no idea the Lord was going to send us here. When I finally got over myself and my doubting and my questions began to go away and the Lord began to repair my heart, People are like, man, oh, what are we going to do? And I said this, if the Lord wants us to have a building, he could just give us one. Yeah. <laughs> I said it more than once to more than one person. And I had no idea what I was saying. Well, we had, technically we bought this for a dollar. I don't know where the dollar went, but. You know, there might some, be some things that come flying out of your mouth that are inspired by God and you might think them funny. Ha, 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 ha. Be careful. Be watchful. Be thoughtful. And be full of faith. Because God can do anything. Amen. Even some rambunctious guy who says, yeah, Lord, well, if it's you, then have me walk out on the water or give us a building. You see, the Lord is schooling me as well as you. So he gets out of the boat. 
He must have appeared crazy to the others, but by the way, it was Peter's idea to walk to Jesus. And Jesus said, yes. And so he said, come. And Peter had come down out of the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. There's that word afraid again. And began to sink as he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Notice the fear. The fear before a false statement. It's a ghost. The fear before Peter fell into the water. Notice the fear. The fear comes. Fear is the opposite of faith. It will be the undoing of your faith. Faith is the antidote to your fear. So what are you afraid of? Heart attack? Stroke? Losing someone you love most? What are you afraid of? You're either going to trust it to the Lord or you're going to put it in your pocket and say, I'll take care of that, Lord. I'll do that. And you're going to have your fingers ripped apart because the Lord wants that, just like Isaac. And it builds our faith. Do you hear what I'm saying? Jesus always wants to be first. Always. But what Peter began to look at was all the wind and the waves, and he started to sink. And I always remember Peter for sinking. But he was the only one that got out of the boat. He's the only one that walked on water with Jesus. The same situation that caused fear in the disciples caused faith in Peter. The same hardship that will strike all of us at the same time will strike us differently. Some of us will be afraid and some of us will be filled with faith. And that is a choice. And I don't want to be the one afraid. If you're a leader, you can't afford that. You're a leader. Fear. Beware of fear. There are things to be afraid of, right? <laughs> I think of uh, the terminal with Tom Hanks. The guy in the airport was trying to lead him into a lie to say that he was afraid to go back to Krakosia. He says, if you tell me that you're afraid that you don't want to go back to Krakosia because you're afraid for your life, I can give you asylum. So are you afraid to go back to your, your country? And he says, no. <laughs> if you tell me you're afraid, I can give you asylum in this country. I'm giving you a way out. I'm trying to help you out. But you have to tell me that you're afraid to go back. Are you afraid to go back? Uh, no. No, I'm not afraid. He goes, well, then I can't let you in the country. He goes, well, but why? But why? I, I, I'm afraid of ghosts. I, I, I am I afraid of Draculia. I afraid he's given him a whole list of things he's afraid of, but he's not afraid to go home because it's his country. What are you afraid of? Whatever it is, you need to bring it to the Lord because it's going to impede your faith. You're able, your ability to trust in him. And you might find yourself sinking. Because you start looking at your situation, you start looking at the waves, you start looking at the wind, and you start thinking, oh, I'm done. This is it. Really? Did the Lord tell you that? Because if the Lord didn't tell you that, how can you be sure? Which is why we need a relationship. Faith is something that gets stronger when you exercise it, like a muscle. All you guys came in here and dropped right in these chairs. You didn't even think about whether it would hold you. Because you've done it a few times. Not even a question. Boom. Full weight. Some of you, it's more weight than others. But you didn't question it. Because you've done it, and you've done it, and you've done it. And faith is like that. You trust the Lord in these things. You trust the Lord in these things. You hear testimonies like the one that I just gave you. It's one of those things that builds your faith. Amen. Put God to the test, men. He will always pass. Amen. Faith is not believing that God can, but that God will. Amen. Abraham Lincoln, the prophet Abraham Lincoln. 
And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith. He had faith, but it was little. Why did you doubt? Great question. He doubted because he looked around. And it's impossible. This is an impossible thing. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. You know, when the lessons learned, troubles go away. And then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. And Jesus didn't tell them, hey, cut that out. You got it wrong. I'm just an angel. <laughs> they worshiped him. They bowed down and worshiped him, something you don't do to people and you don't do to angels. Jesus accepted worship. But then you already knew that. I was reminded of a passage in Isaiah, which says his sand is still stretched out. His hand is still stretched out. Much like the picture that you see where Jesus is reaching down. I imagine Peter, you know, a couple of bubbles, you know, and Jesus reached down under the water to pull Peter up. Jesus will do that for you. Peter wasn't special. At least he wasn't so unique that he's not unlike us. You need Jesus to pull you up. Some of you are in a place where you're drowning and your faith is whittled away to just a whisper. You can trust him. You can absolutely trust him. Fear is not our friends. It's, it's our enemy. And the enemy himself will whisper in your ear and tell you things that are not true to fill out the empty spaces on your little Mad Lib sheet. Or it will be faith. Either you're going to believe what you know about God and you're going to trust that God's going to take care of you or you're not. And then fear will run your life. And it doesn't matter where you are or what the sea that you're in is like. God is still able, isn't he? And Jesus can come to you in the middle of the night when you are expended, when you're done, when you don't think you can go another foot. Jesus will take you. He has. And I can tell you he has for me personally. And I'll bet we could go around the room and, and tell stories about that. That's the God we serve, man. And we can absolutely trust him in every respect. He still holds his hand out. 